artist and poet, uh, and I'm fascinated with words and their role in performance. Um, I co-founded and run Light Our Minds, an artist-run space in Finsbury Park, North London. And since then, I've become fascinated also with light. I'm very happy to be here today giving you my talk on light and language. Also, thank you for some exchange rates as well. Isn't it amazing that we have the ability to see something and not signify it until it is explained to us, and hear something but not comprehend it until we see it? My art practice. As artists, we are explorers, curiosos, and opportunists to experience. I learned early on in life that language was a tool to be played with. Primarily, I'm interested in language, not as a linguist, but as an active listener of other people, an interpreter to their words and rhythm. My mother was my biggest influence when it came to language. Her idiosyncrasies were, for me, unmatched in their abstraction. As a child, when she spoke to me, I would close my eyes and stand braced and become an aeroplane, as her language immersed me like a luminous cloud of the sky, my face reappearing through the soft, dissipating violet, cyan and magenta mist. Her language was out of rhythm. I understood what she said by how she said it, not what was being said. Ever since, the use of language has always been a key interest for me, and the language used became not so important. So, what is the use of light? Light is responsible for colour and stimulates our visual systems and perceptions for relating to it. One of my first understandings of light was with Isaac Newton. Newton escaped the plague epidemic ravaging through Cambridge in England, Woolsthorpe Manor, his country home, and that of a very famous apple tree. It was here that Newton showed in his prismatic colour experiments with light in 1672 that white light consisted of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. This can easily be remembered as an acronym of Roy G. Biv. Newton set about disproving initial dismissals of his, his, of his experiment, that it was the manufacture of imperfections in the prism, <coughs> glass, <laughs> the prism itself an object that, wait, sorry, I'll start that sentence again. Newton set about disproving initial dismissals of his experiment, that it was the Im manufacture of imperfections in the prism, glass, the prism itself, an object that emitted the colour. I've lost that sentence, sorry, you'll have to guess that one. He did this by adding a second prism to the experiment, so the first prism split the light into Roy G. Biff. Oh, no. So, um, the first prism split the white light into the Roy G. Biff spectrum, and the way that he was able to show that it was what, uh, white light was made up of the Roy G. Biff spectrum was to add a second prism at, at the same angle. And this second prism then brought all the colours back together and shot it off into white light. So he did this by adding a second prism to the experiments. The first prism split the right into the Roy G. Biff spectrum and shone into the second, which recomposed back into a ray of white light. This was a crucial experiment to show that white light is made up of a colour spectrum and is not solely white light. Newton showed that every colour has a unique angle of refraction. Colour is a property of light, the visible spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is what describes all the wavelengths of light. The wavelengths of light visible and interpretable to the human eye and mind are called the visible spectrum. Our colour spectrum is Roy G. Biff. Red being the longest waves and blue being the shortest. Either side of the red and the blue are colours and light that we can't observe. Our eyes have three types of light receptors located in the retina, one of which is cones. Cones detect colour. We have millions of cones, and cones are sensitive to wavelengths of red, green and blue light. And when our minds register these in different proportions, we create millions of subtle colours and we use these to interpret our surrounding environments. When all the cones are stimulated equally, the brain interprets white light. The light's are long. In 2012, the visible spectrum of light was dealt to me in a completely new way. I'd never seen it before. I experienced the Lucia number three, 
pulsating LED lighter electro-based psychedelic festival. This involves getting comfy and closing your eyes, and with eyes closed, meaning not looking at light in the usual way with open eyes, as soon as the lamp fired up and started to pulsate, my vision was brought to the inside of my eyelids, and what I now know as phosphenes went whizzing like left, right, up and down, side to side, diagonal, um, and there was no way that I couldn't turn my head and not be entwined in this beautiful chaotic cloud of internal colours. I was immersed once again in the violet cyan and magenta mist I experienced when I closed my eyes as a child when my mum spoke. I began to form some sort of synesthetic connection between how we see, interpret and experience light and how that has an impact on the language we choose to use and how we use it to understand our connections to the people, objects and environments in our lives. When I arrived home that evening, I mentioned this to my dad, who was a practicing Quaker. Quakers are known as children of the light. And my first experience with interpreting the word light had begun. We set about acquiring the Lucia light, and 2013, Light Eye Mind opened its doors with a flickering light installation. Light Eye Mind is on a public road, and so it's accessible by everyone. We initially, we were only going to open for six weeks and anticipated only friends and family would come to see us. But the space had like a mysterious quality to it. There was no, there was no signage. They had a black hydroponic tent in the middle of a room, a trippy red yellow oil lamp, uh, projection, a plant and a brush. People on the street became curious. As curious people wandered in and experienced the light, the word spread quickly of a crazy light machine in town. It's hard to explain exactly what it does. People replied, you just have to go and try it. And what started to happen, and I began noticing in this time, was just how buzzed and charged the interactions were with people who experienced the Lucia. People wanted to stay longer after their experiences and chat. We had seating in the back space, and this became known as the light salon. Light was acting as the primary stimulator and anchor point for conversation. They were emphatically charged between zoologists, biologists, DJs, students, esoterics, occultists, lawyers, finances, manics, and skeptics. I was hyper stimulated by the conversations in the light salon, and it was here that conversations were so excitable, creative, abstract, and bizarre. I listened to people, and after the time, I don't think we understood one another, but the rhythm that bounced off the walls was a feeling as though we were collaborating, a better understanding of something sharing abstract, unfathomable scientific information and using this to discuss our spiritual natures and that was sight, sound, language, colour and consciousness. It was an environment dedicated to understanding language stimulated by light. So, you know, that was a very brief synopsis of visible light and also my excitement from the light salon where light and language were working simultaneously enabling us to experience something different. I wish to mention a little about language and how light has gone on to further my understanding of words. The visible spectrum of language. What has now gone on to be important to my work as I use light to look at the visible spectrum of language is that I see, now see light as the facilitator of language. We're in effect having a conversation with the Roy G. Viv Rainbow. The visible spectrum of language also has another spectrum. It facilitates direct interpretation. Language enables us to see the to see language enables us to see the world differently. Language, as much as it is limiting, also enables us to be extremely creative. A light is recognized in science as a particle in a wave. Scientists have concluded that this helps to explain and interchange the two main theories of our universe. What I've noticed is that we don't really understand anything. Science is a temporary fact but can give us sincere elation and connection purely on the fact that it has been observed and expressed. Light is a magical element that reacts with photopigments and surfaces of objects to provide form. Language is important to describe the world around us. If I look at an artwork and place my language onto it, it is subject to change if the artist uses language to put forth their intended meaning. Conclusion. Light is the language of love. <laughs> light pulls language into new forms. Light gives the light to our experiences together. In all our chaos, there can be art. And art is not to be expressed scientifically, and that's what I love about it. It's shown to me that art is the method by which we transcribe our experiences together. 
The others of incense is miscommunicated, and it's, but it's there to be embraced. We are here to be embraced by each other. <laughs> As a collective, we are in constant experiences of detachment, and into which we immediately birth into new experiences. This is creation. Art is creation. Creativity is to be free from the ideas of destruction, and destruction is a disconnection from the essence of light and a lack of connection 